the EP Podcast. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found, and always at the eppodcast.com. Glenn Panuski is a big fan of the show, a big friend of the show, does so much around Evergreen Park for Evergreen Park and the village, and he's been asking forever to host the show, and I figured, what the heck, right in the middle of the holidays, let's do it. So you're hosting the show. That's a fact. That's, this is awesome, okay? So Glenn Panuski from the village, I'm just going to sit back, I'm the guest today, this is awesome. This is perfect for the holidays, I'm going to crack open a, a cocktail, a beverage, because if I'm the guest... You know, this is what I want as a guest. I sit at my own bar. Well, listen, you've been doing this for, you've had this podcast going for about about a year and a half now, I want to say, correct? Yes. I think the first episode was towards the back end of August of last year. So I'm out there thinking, well, okay, uh, there's some people that know you, that follow you because they know you. Right. But there's some people, well, who is this Chris Lanuti guy? Well, what's funny is I think the most people that listen to the show don't know me. That's, well, now because, they will. Well, yeah, because the funny thing is, is that I think the people that know me have known me living in Evergreen as something completely different. And then I'm like, hey, I'm doing a podcast. And they're like, oh, Chris is having his midlife crisis. And I'm not going to contribute to it. So like, it was like, like my wife always laughs. She's like, I guarantee, like she sees in areas of Evergreen away from where we live. She sees more of the, the car magnets and she runs into people that she doesn't, she doesn't know who will tell her, oh yeah, I listen to the show. And what's funny is then we'll be at something like the kid's school over at Redeemer. And people are like, you still doing that thing? How's that working out for you? Like, I'm like the sad little guy who was like, who decided he was going to do something else with his life at the age of 42. Right. right. <laughs> we should all be so lucky. <laughs> right. <laughs> it won't be lucky if it doesn't work out, Glenn, but so far, so good. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Well, okay. So let's, okay. You told me once you are, uh, you've been living here in Evergreen for 15 years. Yes. That's, that's, that's about right. Right around 15 years. Okay. So where were you born and raised then? 80th in Spalding. Uh, was, okay, I, still I from up, Chicago. Yeah, I grew up at 8046 South Spalding uh, in the Ashburn neighborhood or St. Dennis Parish, however you want to want to kind of classify it. Well, now, so when did you get the itch uh, to get into radio? Was that something early on? I, I got into radio because I was angry at somebody. Okay. <laughs> like, it's the funniest okay, thing. There's like, a story to yeah, tell. Yeah, no, <laughs> I was, I was going to be a, a print journalist. I really liked writing. I, I was a writer. I was a quiet kid. Like I, I, and so I wrote for, I went to Brother Rice and I wrote for the standard, which was like the paper that they had in the school. And I really liked doing that. I liked writing columns. I liked reporting news. And I went to the University of Illinois, Chicago for my first year of college because my folks couldn't afford to send me to Champaign. Like, I, I remember I applied to like a bunch of different colleges and got accepted to like all these big schools. And I was like, yeah, that's great. We can't send you away. So that first year until things started going better for us as a family, I couldn't do it. Right. I, my whole thing was I was going to be a journalist, a print journalist. I joined the newspaper down there, wrote for the UIC Flame for the entire first semester. And towards the back end of the semester, there was a shootout that happened at a Greyhound station, like right up the, like right near where the main part of the campus was. And two guys got shot in the middle of the street with like a machine gun. And I just happened to be a couple blocks away when the shots rang out. And so I put my investigative journalism hat on as the police were swarming the scene and got down there around the crime scene. And I was able to get a lot of information about the shooting, which had happened right off the campus because my dad was a police officer. Like I was like, Hey, so-and-so like I knew him. Right. So I got this really good story written. That was a front page story. That was like a real news story, which is something you didn't really get the opportunity to do. And I came back to school after the weekend when it was published and my name wasn't on it. But the person who ran the newspaper, like the publisher who was like a senior she put her name on it instead. Uh huh. And when I complained to the publishers, they said, well, you're just a freshman. You have lots of time to do that, but she's trying to get a job and this will help her career. So I quit because that was unethical. Exactly. And I was angry. Yeah. yeah. And there were some guys who were starting a radio station on campus. And I threw my energies into that just because I wanted, I still wanted to do something with media, but I had at that very moment, I decided that everything about journalism was crooked. Like I just like, like my first, my first like brush with journalism was that it was all, it was all bull. Like they, it was just the most cutthroat thing in the world. I'm like, I hate this. Like if that's how things work, like if I can call the publisher and be like, this girl stole my story. I have all my notes. Here is the proof. And they're like, oh yeah, it's obvious she stole it. But you know, you'll have plenty of time to make it big. We need to help her out now. 
And I, that was the end of it for me. And then I just started doing radio at a, in their little college radio station and fell in love with it so much that I decided very quickly it's what I wanted to do. Wow. Yeah. Now, so you, that's when you started doing morning radio? No, actually, I, um, I went down to Champaign and they had this really cool station that was, had a bunch of college kids like on air. But it had a professional sales staff, a professional general manager. It was a it was a company, and so they were their own private thing. They were like rated on Arbitron ratings books, and like they actually got numbers in competition with the other stations in town in Champaign. And they weren't just a college station. There were only two of them at the time like that in the country. And that it doesn't even exist for them anymore. They tore it down. They they went back to being a regular college station, which I will never understand. But I got there and I had to work my way up. Like I had to I had to learn how to do it. I had to earn myself an on-air spot at like two o'clock in the morning. I did this show like on Saturday nights at 2 a.m. where I started doing like crazy stuff in, in between the songs because it was just a rock, like a rock alternative station. And I got a cult following. And when the morning guy graduated and moved on, I p- somehow won the job. I just worked really hard and I won the job and I became the morning guy. And I was the morning guy for the last two years. I was down in Champaign. And it went, the show went, it was the last place morning show out of 30 different morning shows in the town. And eight months later, it was the number one morning show in the target demographics of 18 to 34, men 18 to 34, people 18 to 34. I, I was second with women. There was, I, I, I couldn't beat the mix station. It was kind of like right. the, the one that you hear now on 101.9 with Eric and Kathy. It was basically the same thing. It was called Popeye and Marge. Right. Popeye and Marge appealed to... Uh, to middle-aged women better than a, than a 19 year old kid on a rock station. So I, I was second to them in the, in the women category, but overall I was, I was the top guy and, and that launched my career. That's okay. That's so, like. so what was your career beyond college? Beyond yeah. college? I went to, uh, I, I left and weighed my options. Like I had offers on the table six months before I left, but I didn't like them. And when I would go and I would visit places, I found that a lot of radio people wanted me to do something with nothing. Like, it was like, oh, you did this great job and like you beat all these big syndicated shows and oh, here, we're going to give you like barely anything and no, no crew, no staff. And so I was waiting for the right thing. And eventually a guy by the name of Frank Bell, who was a uh, a big wig at a a company, he had an opening and it was, and I took a job in Wheeling, West Virginia. And so then I worked in Wheeling, West Virginia and then, and they, they were already big. I just had to basically come in and take a show that was a, like, I had to take a, a, a station that was already number one and keep them number one. So that wasn't a hard thing to do. You know, just got to don't screw it up was that one. And it broadcast into the Pittsburgh area. So you like, you got a little bit more exposure. And then I went to Reno, Nevada after that and Bakersfield, California after that. Okay. So how long ago was your last radio show? I quit quote unquote radio. I quit live on air. In uh, late September of 2003 from Bakersfield, California. Okay. I quit in a contract dispute. Okay. So between that and when you started getting into the podcast uh, genre, I yeah. guess you'd say, what went on? Obviously, you got married. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I married my, my wife I met in Wheeling, West Virginia. She, like, about a year into my two-year stay there, uh, she got hired on as a salesperson. But I had met her, I think, the weekend beforehand, and I was unable to get her information. Like I was like, I totally struck out. I'm never going to see this girl again. Uh-uh. And then all of a sudden, like Monday morning, I come walking out after doing my show and they're introducing her around. Cause she's the new sales person. And she's like you. And I'm like you. And like, it was like one of those funny things where like we had met each other and had this, you know, really cool night, just hanging out with each other right, talking. Right. And then I just was like, I'm never going to see her again. And all of a sudden she was there. <laughs> No Glenn's hosting, and we will be back to our regular format next week. We still have to keep the EP word on the street. So give us the word, Glenn. All right. The Village Hall and the Community Center will be open on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve from 9 a.m. to noon. However, we will be closed on the holidays themselves. Now, obviously, the police department and the fire department are always open. A reminder that Christmas Day and New Year's Days are, of course, holidays for waste management as well. So therefore, the pickups normally scheduled for Wednesday and Thursday are now Thursday and Friday. Uh, the Rec Department Candlelight Theater presents Candlelight Serenade on Saturday, January the 25th at 7.30 at the Senior Center. Concert, followed by a wine and cheese uh, appetizers um, uh, mixer. That is $18 for adults, $15 for seniors and students. Soft drinks are available, and the tickets will be available at the Community Center on January 2nd. We're a couple of uh, months away from Flake Fest in February. That is Saturday, February 8th at the Capuano Ice Rink. 
uh, from one to six, and by that time, pretty, pretty much people have winter up to their chin on that one. Yeah, so. I'm almost there. Right, I know, right. If there weren't Christmas lights, I'd really hate this right uh, But it's a fun afternoon. Go out there and <laughs> skate and all that. That's your EP, Word on the Street. Remember, if you are listening through a link, you should subscribe. It's free, and you never want to miss an episode. You can find us everywhere podcasts can be found, and always at the eppodcast.com. Listen up, EP Podcast listeners, for something big from core fitness and physical therapy. If you're not sure what your needs are, or if physical therapy is the right course of action for you, they are now offering a free 20-minute evaluation. All you have to do is call to schedule it, 708-422-0990. And if you mention the EP Podcast, you get a special gift. Core gives you one-on-one care inside of a facility that's much more like a spa than a clinic. Core Fitness and Physical Therapy also offers Pilates mat classes as well as group equipment classes, whatever your need. Give them a call today, 708-422-0990 or stop by their newly renovated and expanded facilities, 2940 95th Street in Evergreen Park. Experience something better at Core Fitness and Physical Therapy. Now these podcasts are starting to become big. And, and to me, this is like this is like when radio was first created in the yeah. 20s. You bought the, the possibilities and, and your own creativity is limitless. It is limitless. It's, it's becoming more limited now because w- like when I first started doing it, like it was 08, I want to say. Okay. And it was funny because I had decided I was going to start one. I had read about them and I was going to start one. And I had to do everything from scratch. And I had this big, bulky, stupid old computer of mine and, you know, was trying to find some software to do some editing. And I had some really cheap microphones and, and I made like this website and a friend of mine, one of my, he was on my original show out in Champaign was searching for friends like this before Facebook. even. Right. Like I hadn't even, I wasn't even on Facebook yet. He was Googling friends of his and he finds my podcast that wasn't even on I couldn't even figure out how to put it on Apple yet. And he finds this broadcastbasement.com and he sends me a message through the email link on this cheaply made website I had. And next thing I know, I've got these other guys that I knew from back in the day and we started doing a show and we just were doing it for fun down here. There weren't a lot of options and we figured out how to get it out there. And then all of a sudden, like we were like one of the top 100 comedy podcasts in the world, according to Stitcher Radio. And it made no sense to me. Like we had thousands of listeners in Germany. Like I, I didn't understand why. Like, like, like they just they loved this in Germany. Like we would get like these numbers back, and I'd be like, "The we were like David Hasselhoff. We were the Hasselhoffs of of podcasting, and it was cool, but it was just it was just a hobby. It wasn't my day job, and it and it didn't even dawn on me for nearly ten years that I could do anything with it except just sit around with my buddies and goof off on the microphone. Well, and a lot of the podcasts I follow, and I'm an old movie fan, so I follow a lot of those kind of podcasts. But these are obviously done by people who they're doing it as a hobby and for the love of it. Now, how how can somebody and can somebody do podcasting as a career? Well, I'm trying to prove that you can. The, the thing is that when I started getting the idea that I wanted to do this, because I always loved radio and I always loved the creativity and the broadcasting part. And I just, I just like the lifestyle. I mean, I get to meet so many cool people like the EP podcast. Like I get to meet like, like all the different businesses and I get to meet all the people in the neighborhood. And I kind of like, you know, I get to make a lot of new friends doing it and people come up and tell me their stories. I always liked that stuff when I did radio and I kind of missed it. And I knew I still wanted to do this. So I started trying to do research on what made money. And what I learned was the only people that were really surviving were people that were already famous. It was very hard, like with the exception of like Mark Marin with the WTF podcast. And he was still a comedian. But he got in so early on it that he had like a built in listenership before people started realizing their other podcasts. And, and Joe Rogan as well. Joe Rogan's got had this. He had plenty of other people that he could get to check out his podcast, and he got in on it so early that he had these built-in listeners. It's you know, it's one of these things where you kind of have to you have to almost be able to bring a crowd. I always say, if podcasting would have been around when I left radio, I would have transitioned to the podcast while I still had the radio audience to drag right, to it. Right. You know, but I realized the only way you could really do it and be successful at it is to have something that was specifically targeted at people. And that's why the the two biggest shows that I do right now are the one that's specifically about the White Sox, and it just covers the White Sox directly in a town where people don't cover the White Sox as much as any of the other major sports teams. 
And there's there's a void there. And that's where the Sox in the Basement show has done so well. And now it's the most downloaded podcast for White Sox baseball, like in in the entire spectrum. It beats beats the one that they put on themselves. Mm -hmm. And then the EP podcast makes sense. And that was an idea my wife kind of floated to me. She's like, you should do something here. And I was like, well, I, and I kind of thought about it. And I was like, well, you know, we're surrounded on like three sides and, by Chicago. And then we've got like Oaklawn and hometown kind of like, you know, keeping us in this little box here. And it reminded me of the smaller town radio stations that I used to work on. And the fun thing about those were is that you could you could market something without having to have a big budget in those small towns. Like I've always treated the EP podcast as my, like what I used to treat the Wheeling West Virginia podcast or the Champaign Illinois pod or the Champaign Illinois radio show or the, or the, or the, the Wheeling West Virginia radio shows like those smaller ones, because it's about in terms of the size of the town and in terms of like the area and everything that I am really going to spend my time in. It's similar to me. And it, it kind of gave me to me, I was like, I can be creative and still offer a service to the people of the town. So it made me, I like that. I always like doing charitable things. I, I, every time I got into a town, I was like, I gotta be, I would join like big brothers, big sisters. And I would start doing like, I always wanted to do some good with it. And I always wanted to be involved when I did things. And I was like, this is great. I can kind of go back to do the thing that I really like doing, which is putting on a show to a specific area. And it becomes something that could be profitable because those businesses are not going to spend you know, $350, $400 every commercial that airs and $1,000 to produce it for somebody in Evanston to listen to, you know, what's going on in Evergreen Park. They're never going to make the drive down here and eat at that restaurant, but I can do better in the flyers. I can do better than the newspaper ads. I can show, I could show my numbers because I'm able to show them all. So I could run it like a small town radio station. That's what I do. Well, you basically are wearing a lot of hats too. You're, you're creative. You're in charge of creative content. You're the voice. Yeah, you are out marketing yourself, you know. Yeah. As you, so that <laughs> and it was funny is that I'm you doing. You gotta be. I know more now than I ever did on the smallest radio station I was ever on. Yeah. Like even on the smallest radio station I was ever on, some I I would have a team of five people that would drag all the equipment out, set up the entire thing, and I would just stand there, and then I would leave, and they would tear it all down, and they would put it back in the car. Now I do the whole thing. Well, what advice would you give to somebody trying to start a podcast? You should do it for fun first. Right. Like that, the, the number one thing is that you should do it for fun and you should like what you're doing. Like I could never do the EP podcast in Oak Lawn. I've been asked that. Would you do one for the Mount Greenwood neighborhood? Would you do one for Oak Lawn? Would you do one in Palos? I've been, I've been approached and it doesn't work because I don't live there and I'm not really as interested in them. And it, it, evergreen makes sense to me because I live here and it's my home community and I want to do something for evergreen. So you, you have to find something you like, like the white Sox are my favorite sports team that there is out of all the sports teams. They're my favorite. It, it, it comes easy to me. I can rattle off anything about the team. So find something you enjoy doing and that you have a passion for. But then the second best thing is sound quality. Too many podcasts sound terrible. I, I it's not me picking on anybody, but you, the microphone was bought for a hundred dollars at, at Best Buy and it's got fuzz in the background and it, it doesn't sound well produced and it drones on for three hours and nobody's going to listen to you for three hours, no matter how funny you think you are. And you have to, you have to have some discipline in terms of making sure that you're willing to put in a little bit in terms of the sound. And then you also have to be able to edit yourself. And that's hard for anybody to do. I'm not saying that like, you know, I have some special gift. I stunk at that. My first few radio jobs, my program directors hated me. I talked forever. I couldn't figure out when to end the break. I didn't know where the punchline was. I, I, I thought that everything I did was so great. And then I got this great piece of advice from a guy in, in the middle of the whole thing who said, if you don't have anything, play a song. You know, if you only have an hour's worth of show for that day, cause you had a bad day the day before play more music and spread it out because you, you'd rather do that than try to stretch things. And that's where the half hour show comes from. That's, that's where the, 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 the way that I edit comes Always from. Always leave them wanting stuff. more. Right. You, and give them the best stuff. I leave stuff on the floor where I laugh at it. Yeah. For all my shows. I, I'll hear a joke on one of my shows. I'm like, that's really funny. But it took me two extra minutes to get to that. And people got bored. Well, that being said, now, what is the hardest thing that you have ever uh, found in putting together the EP podcast? Well, the hardest thing was the beginning was trying to get people to understand what it was and to be on it. Like getting guests at the beginning and getting people that wanted to come out and talk. Like nobody knew what it was. The first few people that we had on here were frightened to death when they showed up at my doorstep. And I was like, come on down to my basement. Yeah. We're going to interview you. And it was creepy. Like I, I told my wife, like you have to be here because most of them, 
it was it was funny. Most times when I reached out to somebody, they would send over a like their female worker, and she was the one that was their spokesperson. I mean, you're sending a young woman over to some dude's house to sit in the basement and do a podcast. It's creepy. Like, I felt creepy. I think from The Village, I think one of the first he had on was Dennis Duffy. Yeah, if I remember he was right. the first one from The Village. And then I think and Dennis, Paisha came Dennis in. was nice to me, but I was lucky with Dennis. I was lucky with Dennis because uh, his younger son, Dennis, went to Brother Rice with me. Okay. So Dennis Jr. had listened to the show and had told me that he would love to help me out when I first started. And... He even was trying to get me like involved with stuff like when we had first started. And I was like, nobody knows who I am. I don't even have the equipment for it yet. I really appreciate it, buddy. Thank you. But we're just not ready yet. But he he kind of and his dad was a teacher over at Brother Rice when I was who there. was my teacher. Right. So he sat there and he's like, remember Chris Lanuti? He's got this podcast. You know, we go on there or whatever. And the first time he came over, Dennis Jr. came over. And I remember that Dennis Sr. was he, as as you would be concerned. He He works in a public office nobody knows what i'm going to do you don't know whether or not i'm going to play like gotcha like hey i'm going to hit you with some crazy question and try to like make you seem like you're an idiot so you know because that's what shock jocks do i mean that's not how i am but you don't know what i am and i remember he listened to it after i even told him before he sat down i'm like we're gonna do it and i'm gonna let you listen to it and and i just want to keep your put your mind at ease and so i had to build up the credibility with people where now i think people trust that you know he isn't an axe murderer and he's not trying to hurt anybody he has an honest right. love Car- of Carl, the area. Carl Bernstein right. and Bob Woodward, you are not. No, you I don't know, want to. Right. There was a time in my life where I, I mean, like, look, what everybody, that's, and that's the other problem with podcast. Most of those people have never done radio before. And so they've never gone through the growing pains of realizing you're not as cool as you think you are. And uh, it's, it's not up to you to become like a big star by putting somebody else down. It's the, it's the normal reaction of anybody who wants to be on the mic, fame, the fame bug hits. And everybody has to go through that growing process. Well, I already went through that. I went through it at 19 years old. I was the youngest morning guy in America. Tom Brokaw yelled about me one time on a, bro- a po- uh, like a broadcast on the nightly news because I tried to sell a baby on eBay because eBay was brand new. And he wouldn't mention who I was, which really aggravated me because I wanted credit for it. But like I was doing outlandish things to try to make a name for myself when I was 19 years old. It wasn't a, I was just I just put a picture of my producer's niece up there with the parents' permission. But like people like thought I was really selling a baby. Like it was a joke. I was just trying to get away with stuff. And I but I went through all of that and now I realize that like hey, edit yourself down, idiot. That isn't any good. I'm very critical of me and I'm not I'm not interested in trying to play gotcha with anybody. I I really do care about what I'm talking about. I, and with the EP podcast, I really care about the the area and I don't want to ever do anything that makes Evergreen Park look bad. Well, and you, that's one thing you had told me once. You just said, listen, what what possible benefit would it be to me to to stir up trouble? Right. I mean, what is your kind of logo here? That's you what know, I want to do. Doing I wanna, the good in Evergreen Park. I want to tear down all of Evergreen Park. I want it to make it seem like a terrible place to live. I want people to move away. I want my property values to fall apart. And and I, I, I want to hurt myself in the end. That's right. what I want. I want exactly. that. Exactly, right, sure. <laughs> Looking for something to do this New Year's Eve, but you don't feel like staying out that late? The Red Palm in Evergreen Park has the answer. It's their 12 Hours to Midnight Party, December 31st from 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Brunch buffet, party favors, countdown champagne toast at noon, bingo with $500 in gift cards up for grabs, and the big prize from Oak Lawn Toyota. You could win a car to kick off your new year. Get in and get your seat as quick as you can before they run out. 30 20 95th Street in Evergreen Park. The Red Palm is your island getaway right here in the EP. With a menu like no other created by Chef Mario and cooked in a beautiful wood fire oven. Unique taste, comfort foods. The Red Palm at 3020 West 95th Street. Island Attitude. Local latitude. Okay, so then the 18, 19 month history of the EP podcast, what was the probably the most rewarding thing that you've gotten out of it? That it worked. Like, it's weird to say that, but it worked. Like, I think creative people, and I, I, I'm not saying that to say that there's something more creative about me than other people, but I like to put things together. Like, I, I was always that way, like, when I was a kid. I like to build things. You know, I like to, I like to create new things. Like, in between my radio and when I got into this, one of the jobs I did was help build a business. Like I started at the ground floor at some company and eventually was helping with the expansion of the business and got hired to my next job because I was good at coming into small businesses and saying, we should do this. And this is how we market this because all that radio experience, like how to self market myself when my budget was low, 
came into effect. And I was, I had these real world solutions to like, this is how we're going to get free advertising. And this is how we're going to get people to find out about our product. And I would do that. So I love building things. And I didn't know if this was going to work. And I knew that if it didn't work, I was going to look really stupid to my neighbors. Like, ah, oh, look at that. Crazy Chris started a stupid podcast, made a bunch of bumper stickers. And nobody listens to it. Like that was like, there was like, that was the only pressure I felt. Like, I don't want to embarrass the kids at school. Like, Hey, you're the one with the lunatic father who thought that like he was going to start a podcast. How does, how does that feel? Like I, I didn't want, so that's probably the most rewarding thing to me is that it, it like people seem to like it. And my kids are not afraid to walk out the door every day and get picked on because well, that, and now that leads into my next question. Now it seems like your family's on board with the whole thing. Yeah, they were. But you were telling you were telling me uh, not long ago that your your kids had their own podcast. They did. Know? They did. They didn't do a lot of work on it. The grow- <laughs> growing up on a podcast was like something they cared about for about three episodes, and I dragged through another seven and then cut it at ten and and ended it. That was that was it. I was done with it. Um, I know when my, when I came up with this idea, it was funny. My wife liked it. She encouraged it. And then all of a sudden she was like, what did I just encourage? And I could see that there was a couple of months there where she was very nervous about it. But now I think that she's, she's uber proud about it. She's probably, she's my biggest fan. She talks me up way too much. And there are times where I don't want to talk about it. And she's like, oh, this is my husband. He does the EP podcast. This is my husband. He does, he does this. He, she, she's, she's always been my biggest fan. And so that, it makes it easier. So six, eight months looking ahead now with the EP podcast, what are the things that you would like to see yourself do with this? I just wanted to continue to grow. Like I, I like that we are in a lot of households. I like that people listen to it. Um, I think I like, I like being involved in stuff that's going on. I'd love to do a concert. Uh, I think that's the, I think that's just the, the old radio guy in me. Like I love to do like a, like the EP podcast does something with like, you know, a food fest or a concert fest or something like my own, my own like actual like thing. Um, but I don't know how soon I'd be able to do something like that, but I, I kind of want the EP podcast to be woven into the fabric of Evergreen park. Like I, like I like it when people call in and they're part of the show. I like it when people write us stuff on the Facebook pages and the Twitter pages so we can interact with people. I love when we're out at live events and people come up and talk to me. I, I really do. I really really enjoy that part of the job. And so the more that we can be involved in things that are going around in Evergreen Park and the more that we can kind of show people like the stuff about Evergreen Park that you didn't know about, I I really like that. So I would just like a lot more of the same as how, especially how things have been going in the last six to eight months where it feels like it's really taken off. We can see this really high spike in numbers and and I just hope that we continue. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that two weeks ago, 133 people got a special treat by seeing you and your daughter on stage when we had done the 1940s radio Christmas. When I, when I was typecast? Really, you were t- well, when you typecast really. me as a radio announcer? Well, you weren't just the radio and announcer. And I stood there with a script and people called it acting? Well, no, but then you did a good Chico <laughs> Marx, too. That's why, do. that's why I gave you that part, just so you, wouldn't, you would be doing more than just the announcer. The, 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 the weirdest thing about the Chico Marx thing, well, there were two things. One... I didn't remember that you had told me that you needed me to do their role. So we're doing the first walkthrough and it was only like two practices and then the show. Right. Because it was a one night show. And your entire theater troupe, they all know how to work with each other. They all know each other's capabilities. Everybody's looking at me. I'm going to tell you. I guarantee you, if not all of them, several of them are like, what is this guy doing here? He's not part of our group. Like, that's how I would feel. I'd be like, who's this guy? He's taking my part. You know, or how's he going to do on this? How do we know he's going to look good at this? And and I was very nervous I was going to do a bad job at it. And... I remember you said you were doing Chico Marx, and I was like, for the life of me, I couldn't remember what Chico Marx did. And thank God for Well, he wasn't the yeah. silent one. I know. I was like, thank God for the YouTube and uh, the ability to bring up a Marx Brother episode. And I watched 15 seconds of a backstage to get his accent down, like just listening to it. And then I walked out and just tried to do the best I could at it. And I couldn't tell until the end if the laughter were people thinking I was doing a bad job or if they liked it, but it seemed like they liked it. Oh, so that, that was first, that was the first <laughs> of the comedy skits that we did in yeah, that, yeah. and that thing was the perfect one to get at the beginning. That guy had a lot of laughs to it. So. I don't think people get that, like a lot of radio people, at least when I was there, I don't know what it's like now, but I know that when I started radio, one of my jobs after I got off of mornings was to be a voice guy for commercials, and they don't always just want me. Sometimes I had to play parts, so I had to do a lot of voice acting. And I'm not saying I'm a great voice actor, but I'm not afraid to like stand in front of the microphone and like sound like an idiot because I, we would do that. I would sit in a production room for like three hours after the show 
and the the production person would be like, I need to put together a commercial for such and such. You're a smarmy mattress salesman, or you're this, or you're that. And I'd be like, all right, and I just do the voices. Like on the smaller stations, they need people to do the voices. So like I became like a voice guy by you know default. And I like to do bits. I like to do comedy bits, especially in my first one. We used to do lots of comedy bits. We do little 30 second to minute long comedy bits, like fake commercials and stuff like that. That would run in between songs or during the things. And so we would develop these scripts and we would do those things. And I always liked the theater aspect of it. Um, my favorite show I ever did, did more theater of the mind than any other show. We would make up all kinds of things. We would, we would, we would have a guy get murdered on the show. And we would make it seem like it was a normal day. I remember one time I pretended like around Halloween that we had this occult book. I always have to ask Father Paul when I do the me and the priest show, you know, am I going to hell for that? And he's like, no, you'll be fine. He's like, you were young and an idiot. But I I pretend I had this occult book and I start reading these made up words that I've come up with where I'm summoning a demon. And we had recorded what it would sound like if the station cut off the air and we just cut the station and we like lace like moaning in there. So then people are calling the station going, I heard something. I heard something in the fuzz that ran for, and I ran the fuzz for two minutes. Like I didn't run the fuzz for 30 seconds. Like it's only works if people really believe the station's been off the air for a couple minutes. Well, and that and, harks yeah. back to uh, 1938 when Orson Welles did that War of the Worlds broadcast. I have the whole thing. I have the whole thing on CD. Somebody gave thing, me as a gift, and I love it. That thing, right, the way they did that with the, in terms of news reports and, yeah. and band remotes and you know, it scared a lot of people. And well, like, well and the, one of the things that we had talked about right after the uh, the 1940s Radio Christmas was I have this idea in my head. Oh, I love your idea. Doing a series. I've already called, sketched it down for 2020. We're doing it. Candlelight right. Theater on the Air, basically a series of maybe 12, 13, 14 minute uh, stories done old, old time radio style. I already came. I, I wanted to change the name a little bit. I wanted to tweak it. Okay. Because I've been doing a little podcast research. Biggest thing going on right now on podcasting, true crime and mysteries. So I'm thinking Candlelight Theater Mysteries is the name of it. Like probably put something like that. Like I think the theater should have at least like like you should have to do a who done it. We're just spitballing here. Right. I I can see the look on your face. You're like this isn't what I want to do, Chris, but I'm telling you. Yeah, but it, it can encompass this is how I a see lot. It. I, yeah, at least right, start right. off with some mysteries because people love that stuff. They eat it up on the podcast. Oh, right, right. You do a series, you do it in certain parts, you release the whole thing, they can binge listen to it like a Netflix show. It's big for podcast. Exactly. Especially if you've got like a 12, 13, 14 minutes, people can right. listen to that. You right, know, right. They plug it into their cars. Well, and that's why I do that. That's why I do the half hour shows. These right. shows have to be short. They have to move. They have to give everybody something. They they can't be on the same thing all the time. Like you sitting around and talking about me, I'm convinced this is just going to like, listeners are never going to listen to this. They're going to be like, I'm never listening to that show again. <laughs> that guy droned on about himself for a half hour. He's boring as heck. Like, that's how I feel when I'm doing it. Right. Yeah. But you're also going to go and edit. So. Oh, yeah. We're editing out all the bad stuff in this thing. Yeah. I'm going to, while you're gone, I'm going to tell better stories and I'm going to insert those in between your questions. <laughs> <laughs> Another show is wrapped up. Another show's in the books. Another show is wrapped up. And then by the looks, it's going to be a good one. And we'll see you next week. And the nude is Another show is wrapped up, another show is wrapped up, another show is wrapped up, and it's in the books. Another show is wrapped up, another show is wrapped up, and by the looks, it's gonna be a good one. New Deal's Basement, broadcast, Basement, the New Deal's Basement, the Broad Basement. Slancha. The EP Podcast. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at the eppodcast.com.